Hey everybody, welcome to WOW. And yes, WOW, what a beautiful day here in Oklahoma. I am actually out in West Oklahoma for those friends of mine that are in the uh, Weatherford, Clinton, uh, Woodward area. Just uh, if you can at all make it over this morning, I will be at Harvest Fellowship with Pastor Mark and Jada Haney. They're in Leedy, and so we start at 10.30, and I've got about a 35-minute drive, so this will be a quickie this morning. But thank you very much for tuning in, chiming in, and making this ministry time. For some of you, it is the church that you go to, and I, I appreciate that. I take nothing away from local congregations, but... Uh, the days of just going to church to say you went to church are ending. People are savvy, and I am a firm believer in getting with a group of people that challenge you. And uh, so hopefully that's what this ministry does is challenge you. And again, thank you guys for chiming in and being a part of this ministry. I travel because of your support. Of course, I'm called to do it, and God is the source, but he uses you. So I certainly appreciate what you do to make that uh, ability to bring the word of life to different people. Uh, let me also say, if you can at all... Uh, be sure and go to the website, markshellministries.com. have a lot of things available there. Uh, you can ask any questions you want concerning what I teach. And uh, if I teach it, I can answer it. So anyway, I had a thought um, because we this social distancing and all of this stuff has really, it, it has cut down on communication, if you will. And I, I was thinking driving in here yesterday, the absolute key to living in peace through anything is a simple word called trust. And if you've been around believers a lot or been in church a lot, you've heard this, just trust God, just trust God. And, and that is a great statement to make, but a lot of people have trust issues. And uh, even in, in psychology, they say a toddler raised around his parents or parent, uh, a toddler, they will wander off to play, but they will come back to see if that parent or guardian is still there. And then they will wander away maybe a little bit farther but then they'll come back and check and see. So they love that consistency. And the very fact that guardian or that parent is where they're supposed to be just creates a trust in them that they can live and have fun and that person is always going to be there. You know, the word says, I believe it's in Proverbs, the third chapter, the fifth verse. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, all your consciousness, and don't lean to your own understanding. And the next verse, very it's not quoted as often, but it is very defining of what that verse says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Because a lot of people say, well, I trust God. But the question is, do you really trust God? If you become anxious, you don't trust God. You know, even in the psychological realm, when a child begins to grow, if those parents portray the world as an unsafe place, and we call them helicopter parents, uh, they just have to watch and, and make every move for the child, most of those children, according to psychology, grow up with anxiety problems because they're afraid to make a decision for themselves because they don't trust themselves. And so I, I want you to begin to trust you because God trusts you. We say we trust God, but we're going to find out by the end of this little short uh, exhortation 
whether or not we really trust ourselves or trust God, and if we have trust issues. And so it, it will be a brief diagnosis that you only you can do a self-diagnosis. You know, again, saying I trust God, it sounds good, but you really know if you do by how anxious and stressed you live. And so in the sixth verse, I believe it is of Proverbs 3, after he said, lean not to your own understanding, he goes on to say that in all your ways, acknowledge him. And if you just read that text, you'll say, in all my ways, okay, I've got to quit doing this, start doing this. I, I need, I really need to shape this up. I need to get this in order. That's not exactly what it's talking about. It can include that. But from the original Hebrew, the word says, in all your communication, it's translated ways, but the Hebrew word is defined as communication. In all your communication, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. And so, trust is built upon communication. There you go. You communicate through your words. You communicate through your attitude. You communicate through your works. You communicate through your deeds. There are multiplicities of ways of communication. And so one of the greatest, I have found this to be true, and I know you probably have too if you've lived long enough, one of the greatest inner pains is to not be trusted. You know, I believe it was over in the uh, the Psalms of David, around the 78th Psalm, you can check it out later. The word says that while the people, the children of Israel were making the journey, the promised land, they provoked God in the wilderness and they grieved him in the desert. Then in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, the 30th verse, the word says very explicitly, grieve not the Holy Spirit. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we do not trust he'll be there. You know, Paul said, when I was a child, I thought like a child, but when I became a man, I put away those childish things. A child, remember, we started off talking about this. A child, a toddler in Christ will always go back and check and see, is he there, is he there, is he there? And as you grow older and trust that he's there, you ought to be able to make your own decisions in life with his help, but God will not helicopter you. He actually lets you live life, and if you need him, he's right there. That's the goodness of God. It is. It has been said, rather, that trust is the result of trustworthy actions. And so trust is built when we observe actions. And those actions let us know if another person is for you, even if it costs them something. And so... There's really primarily two components to building trust. One person doing and the other person recognizing. See, God does so, so many things for us that many times we don't even thank him for. We just take it for granted. But everything, have you ever wondered why all those stories are in the Bible of what God did for people? So we would develop trust that he'll be there even if we wander off too far, mess up. He is always there. And so, and, and I, I found this very intriguing that researchers, they found that when people felt they were trusted, now you guys that listen to this enough know what, I'm really into neuroscience and psychology and psychiatry and, and 
see how it blends with the scripture, but they found when people felt trusted, their brains respond by producing oxytocin. An oxytocin chemical is what they call the cuddle hormone or the love hormone. When you trust someone, you want to be around that person. And so trust is developed. How, how do I put this? Trust is developed when you have the opportunity to let someone down or hurt them, but you don't. That develops trust in them toward you. See, the word says God, love never fails. God never fails. God has never failed you, not once. There, there are, I, I would say, in my summation of what I studied, there are four basic components of a person that is trustworthy. They are consistent. Even if they don't respond to what you want, they always meet your needs. Some people, they say, oh, I trust God, but they still live anxious because in the back of their mind, they remembered they asked God for this job or for that job. They wanted to buy this car or buy that house and it didn't work out, but yet they're living in a place. They have a roof over their head. And so the enemy will use that to say, well, you can't trust God because you asked him for that, for that house and you didn't get that house. So, you know, that, that is not the truth. Consistency. God's, God's ways go way beyond ours. In other words, he sees what could damage you later, okay? He sees exactly where your life is headed. And yes, he will not answer some prayers that you have or I have simply because he knows on down the road that is not going to be the best thing in your life. He is not helicoptering you. He's making every possible way that you can live your life, make your decisions. If something doesn't work out, you're still happy because you know you can trust him. Another component to trust is compassion. The word says, I think it, it's in the gospels, Jesus had great compassion on them. Compassion is feeling the, having the empathy, feeling what they feel. You know, you can trust a person that is not only consistently there for your needs, but they feel what you're going through. They feel your feelings. And uh, another component is the communication. You can communicate with a person you trust. You can tell them how you feel. If you feel like getting mad at God, tell him how you feel. Now, you won't hear a lot of ministers tell you that, but this is a relationship. We, we always say, oh, I'm, I'm not a person of religion. I have a relationship. Well, if you truly have a relationship with God, you can be yourself to him. You can tell him exactly how you're feeling instead of just saying, well, he knows how I feel. He knows how you feel, but until you vent it, it's going to well up and boil over inside of you. What you don't vent to God, you will. And you hear me. Do you hear me? You will ultimately vent on some other person. If you don't vent it to God, you will vent it on someone else. And I'm seeing all you guys chime in. Thank you so, so very much. And pass this around. Another component of trust is competency. Is that person able? Yeah, I trust God because I know his ability. I trust me. My question is today also, do you trust yourself? Do you feel like you're consistent do you feel like you have compassion? Do you feel like you communicate with people 
and and let them vent to you just like you can vent to them? Do you feel like you are considered competent? Do you see yourself as having the ability to be trusted? And so, again, just saying, well, I trust God, that means I know he is consistent, he's compassionate, he is communicative, and he is competent. So trust in the Lord <coughs> and lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways, in all your communication, acknowledge him, and he'll make your path straight. So you could skinny it down to this definition of trust. Trust is literally the firm belief in the, re in the reliability, the truth, the ability, or the strength of someone. God is reliable, he is truth, he is able, and he is strong. So if he is all that, How can we have trust issues? Well, Mark, I don't know if I have a trust issue with God when a problem arises. How easy is it for you to cast your care on the Lord? If you trust him to handle it, why are you still worrying about it? Hmm. See, I in in my studies I was I was looking at this and there there are three main Hebraic words for the English word trust. One is aman Another is gatal, another is bata. And aman just means to trust, to go to the right hand, the strength, to believe. But I love this definition of trust according to the word aman. It means to simply be quiet. How quiet can you be in your struggle? If you're having to voice your struggle, you're really not trusting. If you really trust it's going to be okay, why are you complaining about it? Gatal, another Hebrew word for trust, means to roll it over, to just pass it on. Cast your care on the Lord. If you truly trust God, it's not your problem. It's now His and God won't share your problem with you. He'll let you try to fix it, or you can let him fix it. There is no 50-50 partnership in your problem. All we do is garden our lives. We cast our care on the Lord. He gives us the seed to sow. He tells us what and where to sow it, and from the moment we sow it, we water it with our trust, our praise. And so the, the third Hebrew word I referred to concerning the English word trust, and I hope you guys are getting this, was bata. Bata means to be careless. Now, understand the connotation of this. To be careless means I'm just not, I'm not worried about it anymore. It's going to be okay. It's like the 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 woman that her son had died and she took him to the prophet. Her husband said, where are you going? She said, I'm going to see the prophet. Well, what's the problem? She never told him the boy was dead. She never told her own husband the boy was dead. Not that he wouldn't have been concerned, but he couldn't fix it. The prophet could fix it. And so she cast her care on the prophet, on the Lord in the new covenant would be the same thing. So she was not anxious. She was not distressed. She trusted because she knew he was consistent. He was compassionate. He knew how to communicate the truth and he was very competent. So how do you know you can really trust God? Well, 
That's what those Bible stories are about, to help build your trust. The Bible wasn't given so you could quote it. It was given so you could know the truth. And the truth will set you free from what? Anxiety and stress. Okay? And so if you're listening to this and you're anxious, you're stressed over something, the degree of anxiety you have is the degree of trust you do not have. And I, I know that's pretty straight. But... It, it's truth. It's truth. And and I am in a hurry and I, I don't have time to suck up too much and beat around the bush. But you may be thinking, oh my God, I may have some trust issues. And you very well may have. We've all had them. Well, how do I know if I've got trust issues, Mark? Well, you just kind of assume that you may be betrayed. God may not take care of it, okay? You, you become overly, overly, even in the natural realm, people that have trust issues, even in relationships, they just wait on something to happen so they can feel betrayed. It's sad, but it's true. There are people like that. Uh, people that have trust issues, they're overly protective and very possessive. When things go wrong, nope, this is mine. This is mine. If you're a person like that, you are literally killing yourself from having a happy life of being able to, number one, trust yourself. But it's hard for you to trust others. Well, Mark, I don't know... I still don't know if I have trust issues. Well, here's another sign you may have a trust issue. When somebody you love or are fond of does the smallest thing wrong, it's hard for you to forgive them of the smallest things. You overthink and you predict someone's going to betray you. You live in fear of betrayal. Let me put it this way. In the absence of trust, fear rules. And the scripture says, God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power of love and of a sound, disciplined mind. In Psalms, the ninth chapter, the 10th verse the psalmist said, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I will not be afraid. So fear rules when trust is absent. So truly, you know, trust is the cornerstone of, of every relationship with your boss, with your spouse, with your significant other, with your church family, with your family, with your friends. Trust is the chief cornerstone. Now, I'm not saying trust everybody. I'm saying you can know who to trust. Are they competent? Are they consistent? Are they compassionate? Are they communicative? Okay? And, and so there are some ways that you can build trust in a relationship. And I've got about two minutes before I've got to go. This is the way, according to psychology, and you can find it in the scripture as well. But when you say what you mean, and you mean what you say, and you are consistent with that, communicative about that, you say it compassionately and with great respect, but yet it is proven you say what you mean and you mean what you say. I get in trouble sometimes because I'm too blunt, and, and I don't mean it to be offensive. I'm just wired that way. Cut the chase, you know? 
cut the chase. When I buy something that has to be assembled, I don't want to, <laughs> I know it's bad. I'm a, it's a guy thing. I don't want to see all the warnings and, and all the phone numbers call, take me to step one. I want to cut the chase. That's just the way I'm wired. And, and when I counsel people, we just go straight to the problem and then we back up to see where the problem would have started and how to solve it at the root. I'm not good at cutting fruit off of trees. I am investigative to go back to why the tree even existed and deal with the root of it. And so to build trust in a relationship, you can start today. Now, if you've damaged trust, that is one of the hardest things to repair because you can't erase memories. Memories are there forever. So you've got to have a want to and a will to, okay? You've got to be able to be vulnerable again. And it's a gradual vulnerability, okay? That means allow yourself to be so open well, Mark, I'm afraid it may happen again. But see, when trust is absent, fear rules. Hopefully this is helping somebody. You, you've got to give the benefit of the doubt. If you're going to build trust in a relationship, and I'm not just talking amongst you and another natural being. I mean, develop your trust in God. Say what you mean to him. Mean what you say. Be vulnerable, you know? Remember the role of respect that you have for him and God respects you because you are the physical existence of God in the earth. Do you realize that? He respects you because you physically represent him. Give him the benefit of the doubt. When things aren't going the way you asked for, the way you wanted, Trust him that he's always going to be there and he'll make sure the needs are met. It may not be the way you wanted or the way you desired, but the end result will be happiness and peace. So, you know, when you build trust or desire to build trust, a, a key step to doing that is take a risk of faith together. God, I'm going to trust you with this seed. God, I'm going to trust you with this act. I'm going to trust you. Let him show his competency. Let him show his capability, his ability. Let him show his consistency. Many times we say, oh, I trust God, but we never take risk that builds that trust in God. And so, to build trust, you've got to be willing to give as well as receive, okay? So, number one, let's start trusting ourselves. Start meaning what you say and saying what you mean. And, and just start, just start putting yourself out there a little bit. And every time you get the fear, oh, I'm going to get hurt again, I'm going to get... You've never lived, you have never truly lived as long as there is fear in your house. I would rather have done something and failed than never had tried at all. So anyway, take a risk on God. Let him, he loves to show off. He loves to show you how consistent he is. Take a risk of faith. Do something you've never done and watch God show off. And I just speak life over you. And if there's been any relationships in your life where the trust has been impaired, I speak grace and peace to you. But understand, if you were the one that broke that trust, you can't determine whether that person's going to trust you again. All you can do is give them every reason to. But don't spend your life trying to rebuild what someone else does not want. And that's the goodness of God. We have broken our trust 
with him so many times it's ridiculous, but he keeps on being consistent. He keeps on being compassionate. He keeps on communicating with us and he keeps on showing us his competency, his ability. So I encourage you, begin to grow in that trust with God. Let him trust you the way you trust him. I hope this helped you guys. I speak blessings and life over you. Don't forget, if you can, become a partner with the ministry. Again, that's how I do what I do. God is good. You are good. Pass this along to people if you don't mind. And be sure and and continue to, to uh, comment on this and it's not about Mark Shell getting out there. It's about the word getting out there. And I believe today will help a lot of people. So trust in the Lord with all your heart and in all your communication. Acknowledge him. You all have a blessed day.